It gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce a really a dear friend, a member of the board of directors of our foundation, a man who has been dedicated almost as long as I have to educating people about the process of investing. And this friend, and by the way, he's also the author of a terrific book. We're going to talk about that book today, Spending Your Way to Wealth. Notice that little, we'll get to that in a few minutes. But I want to introduce Paul Hayes. Paul, welcome to Sound Investing. Great to have you here. Well, thanks for the invitation to be here. I'm glad to share some ideas and thoughts with you and your audience. Terrific. Uh, before I let you loose here, because you've got a lot to share, I want to tell you how different the work that Paul and I do is. It's not that we don't understand what the other person is doing, but our focus is very different. And I'm going to share my focus so that Paul can then differentiate between what he has focused on in helping investors. And they're both I think very, very important. And in my case, I'm the numbers guy. I'm the guy that's trying to teach people about risk, uh, risk and return, and 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 asset class uh, diversification, and identifying the asset classes and how to put them together, and uh, how to take money out of the portfolio, how to put money in the portfolio. It all has to do in a sense, with the physical aspect of investing and the decisions that revolve around those step-by-step -step things that you might do. I want to make sure you don't pay too much in taxes. I want to make sure you have low expenses. I want to make sure you have an index fund. There's a whole list of things that I want to see you doing if I can, if I can uh, convince you that's the right thing to do because I believe they will lead to higher rates of return. And by the way, I, I'm going to put a number on that. I'm going to say that if you don't properly uh, control expenses, control diversification, control active versus passive management, control the taxation of your earnings, it could be costing you 4% a year in returns. And then if you hired and paid somebody 1% a year, it could be 5% a year in your returns. So these are big, important decisions. But Paul, outside of all this physical stuff, let's get in to that part that you focus on. Really what I consider, I don't, I'm not going to call it woo-woo, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm just going to say that it's the kind of the emotional aspects of this process which is not a part of what I teach. Well, that's where my focus lies. Uh, go back 50 years when I started as a financial advisor and for the next 25 years as a financial advisor, I was always interested in the different returns that people got when they were making the same kinds of choices often. Uh, it seemed like more often than not, the investor return, the duration of time they held something, determined the investment return for them. But it wasn't really the investment return of the investment because maybe they bought and sold so frequently or at the wrong time that they denied themselves the opportunity to maximize the return. And I was amazed at over 25 years that I seemed to find that maybe five or six or 10% of the people I dealt with really understood the basic difference that would make the difference in their re return. And about 80% of the people or 90% always seemed to suffer from I want to say from being themselves, because mm -hmm. we are humans and we fall victim to ourselves as we fall victim to the other things that enter into our decision making. So the book title, Spending Your Way to Wealth, focuses on the word spending, but that's not necessarily about money. Spending is something we do all the time, every day. It's our most frequent behavior. It's our most essential behavior. It's our life-saving behavior because we spend energy as we spend money and we spend time. We spend a lot of things other than just money. In fact, if you look at all the time spent on breathing, we spend 100% of our day spending. 
At night when we're asleep, our brain is working, it's causing our heart to beat, it's causing the blood to flow. So we're expending something all the time. So if it's our most common behavior, we need to take more time to analyze what our behavior is, why we behave the way we are and who we are. And if you can somehow come to grips with the fact that we're human and we are prone to making sometimes very predictable mistakes, that's what I'm all about. It's helping people understand who they are, challenge themselves to find out what are their biases, what makes them think the way they do, what makes them act the way they do, and that's why they get the results that they do. And if we can just become more aware of our human tendencies so that we can intervene as needed. And my book parallels the finding of a probably the most, uh, the most essential and uh, recognized psychologist in the world today, Daniel Kahneman. He spent a 30 year career exp explaining and probing into how people make financial decisions. And he came away with some very strong evidence to support that many of the decisions we just typically make are not necessarily wrong, but they aren't right to the fullest degree possible. Uh, he published, you know, his work was uh, the basis for his being awarded a Nobel Prize about uh, 25, about 20 years ago now. And 10 years ago, he wrote a wonderful book that was the basis for his Nobel Prize called Thinking Fast and Slow. Most people have never read the book unless they're an economist. And if they're an economist, they know his name very well because he literally changed the minds and the way economists go about making financial decisions, changed the minds of economists throughout the world. And yet most of us, other than the economists, probably don't know who he is. So I am trying very hard to bring him to the forefront so that non-economists are as familiar with his findings and can benefit by understanding more about themselves. The back part of my book, there's a 15-page summary of thinking fast and slow, that if all somebody read was that 15-page summary, they'd have a wonderful insight into themselves by somebody who got a Nobel Prize in understanding our behavior. I think, Paul, that what you do that is so great. I mean, that that little piece at the back of the book is golden. I mean, if people bought the book and even read that, that would be a huge step. But what you do that I find so uh, important is you then take, and there are, as I recall, 48 different kinds of biases that we carry around and how we make our decisions. And then you apply those biases to show people how that becomes part of the investment process and how easy it is to get trapped or tricked into following your natural human instincts versus what with some intellectual focus would lead you to a very different decision. And I I think that's a, a marvelous part uh, about the book, but I didn't mean to interrupt as I always do. Please go right ahead. Well, that's the essence of the book. And you say there's 40 some biases. I made a list of about 300 biases that I have. Oh. And we really think about it. I mean, if if you have an itch, you scratch it. You're biased to scratching an itch. We have biases we don't even think about. In fact, most of our biases are unconscious. They just happen. Uh, I'm biased to trying to be happy. I'm biased to being optimistic. Uh, I'm biased to uh, being satisfied with whatever it is I'm trying to do. I have all kinds of biases. And the most helpful thing I ever did was sitting down and just analyzing what they are and why I have them. You know, are they something that's genetic? Was I born with them? Uh, was it something that was environmental? Did I discover it along the way and become biased? We all have these biases. It's perfectly normal, and we need to have them. Kahneman in his book talks about two sets of two sides of the brain, or he doesn't talk about sides, two systems within the brain, system one and system two. And the beauty of his work is he simplifies things to the point where we can all understand it if we just take the time to try. System one is the reason, and it's the instinctive and the the impulsive part of our brain that lets us answer a question immediately without thinking. What's two and two? Four. You know, what's 37 times 28? Oh, geez, I have, might have to write that down to do the math. I can do it, but yeah. it takes a little deliberation. It's time consuming. It's energy consuming. Uh, it's tiring. So we're sort of loath, uh, we're loath to spend if we don't have to. Time, money, energy. We're loath, loath to conserve everything so that we don't have to spend it. Because uh, when we spend it, we get tired. You take a long exam and you come out exhausted. You work hard all day and you come away exhausted because 
that expenditure of energy and time does demand uh, satisfaction. So understanding that aspect of the brain, system one and two. Go ahead, Paul. Can I, can I ask you a question? Because I've never thought about this before, but the people, let's call them Wall Street, just for a way to identify them as a group of, of people who want us to buy something they have for sale. Do they have a different set of biases? Uh, I suspect they do. That is part of the sell, the sales pitch. And then we have a completely different set of biases to respond to that sales pitch. Is that the way it works? Everybody's trying to, to manipulate going the easy way to get what they want? Well, we all have a self-interest. It's perfectly normal and it's perfectly natural. And uh, a business has a self-interest of staying in business. Uh, an individual who's a Buddhist monk, I don't mean to pick up a religion, but they may have a bias to just feeling good about humanity. They have no need for money. Everything's taken care of. So we can have different kinds of biases. Wall Street isn't all bad because they have a bias to stay in business. Uh, I left Wall Street completely, severed all ties with any kind of a Wall Street firm or any firm that sold or was involved in securities because I didn't want to have that perceived conflict of interest. I wanted to focus on an individual. And I collaborated for 25 years with a psychologist at the University of Washington, uh, and we focused on performance. He was an enhancement performance psychologist. He worked with sports teams to help sports teams do better. Why would a manager of a ball game hire a psychologist to come in and talk to his players? Well, if you're standing at home plate in Yankee Stadium, you want to relax. You want to focus. You want to have the control over yourself. So thinking on the part of an athlete is a big part of winning. And he was delighted to take the time to really explore how people make financial decisions. How can we enhance our behavior? Well, you start by understanding the things that influence our behavior. And that's uh, where we get back into biases. You know, why are, we, why are we talking to each other today? We both have a bias towards helping people make good, sound investment decisions. We're not paid to help them do that. In fact, neither one of us are compensated. We have a financial education a foundation each. And uh, that's our whole focus. We just would like to see people prosper to a greater degree uh, than most of them tend to uh, default to. So just taking a little bit of time, take 10 minutes before you go to sleep at night or five minutes before you go to sleep and five minutes in the morning or when you wake up in the middle of the night and just think about who we are. Why do I have this notion that when I leave a room, I ought to turn a light out? What's That's a bias. No, bias to turning on a light. Well, my dad used to run around the house when I was five and say, turn out the light when you leave the room. I think we're working for the electric company. Uh, well, I'm biased because my dad, I guess, biased me or he biased me to realizing the benefit of turning off a light. In my book, I talk about a woman who works at home and uh, uh, leaves lights on in the room when she leaves. And uh, in the course of a 25 year career, 40 year career, I think in the example I used, uh, she spent $70,000 on wasted electricity because they're not turning on a light. But if that same $70,000 had gone into an S&P index fund, here we're talking about a no-load mutual fund that invests in the 500 basic large companies in this country, she'd have $340,000. And I'm, that, that number, I think I, I may be a little high, there, but it's enormous what a little bit of money amounts to over time. And that's where you're so helpful in pointing that out to people. Uh, and the magnitude is the... so so Paul I hit us with a yeah the number one let's say the number one bias that that keeps people from achieving their financial goals is there one that stands out yeah there's there's several that are probably uh, almost equal to one another in terms of their prevalence and in terms of their uh, essential impact they have on decisions mm -hmm. one is our fear of regret you know, anything we do has a consequence. And if we think about the consequence and we think it's something that could be bad, then we don't, we don't do it because we don't want to look back and regret having done something. Uh, and we get much more dissatisfaction, much more emotional uh, impact from losing money than we do from gaining a similar amount of money. Isn't that interesting? If we lose money, we lose $100 or we lose $1,000, it has a tremendous impact on us, much more than if we win $100 or 
and make a thousand dollars. And that regret is so prevalent. That fear of loss is so prevalent. It keeps us from doing something as essential uh, as investing and spending on investments is, you know, another form of spending. Uh, we also have this notion that somehow we're smarter than we really are. You know, mm -hmm. I think I'm intelligent, uh, but if I ask a, a hundred people in an audience to close their eyes and raise their hand if they think they're a better driver than everybody else in the room, about 70 or 75 percent of the hands go up. Statistically, mm -hmm. it's not possible. You know, you can't have 70 percent of the people better than average because, uh, uh, you know, it just it, it can't be. Uh, but that idea that uh, that we just are smart, you know, we had a successful career or we're having a successful career. So I must be capable of doing just about anything, especially if it's investing, because all the time I see on TV, all these people are supposed experts and they're being reminded about the things they did last week or last month or last year that caused their performance to be either really good or really bad. And we have a great tendency to want to follow a herd. You know, that's a, a bias that we have. Stay with the crowd. You know, you're never really wrong if you're with the crowd all the time, unless the crowd is always wrong, in which case you are wrong. So just recognizing those biases and teaching ourselves to overcome those biases by shifting things from system one to system two. Think about it a little bit longer. Why do I think that? Why do I like blue better than green? Well, I don't know. I do. So if I'm aware of it, you know, maybe if somebody wraps their product in green, I'll be more inclined to buy it. Well, it doesn't make the product any better. They're just playing to my bias. Yes, yes. Well, this tendency to always think that we're smarter than others is an overwhelming bias because it makes us think we can do things that we probably can't do as well as we uh, would like to. Uh, the tendency to follow a crowd, kind of a herd mentality. That's part of our basic nature. If we stay with the herd, you know, uh, we probably are going to be okay. The herd will protect us and the herd probably won't all be wrong. But sometimes the herd is wrong. And sometimes that herd mentality really works against us, especially in bubbles in the financial market or in periods of uh, drought where everybody is sort of down in the dumps and in the gloom and or everybody is thinking everything is wonderful, all of Pollyannish uh, attitude. Financial markets have a behavior of their own. It represents a crowd behavior. Uh, one day the crowd is optimistic, the next day they're pessimistic. And one year they're good up, one year they're down. People think that they lose money if they have money invested in stocks and a portfolio or any kind of a financial asset. If the price or the value of those assets go down from day to day, which they will do, uh, you haven't lost money necessarily, but we think of it as losing money. In fact, the commentators on the radio or TV will say, well, we lost money today. The markets were down. No, you didn't lose money any more than if somebody knocked on your door while we're talking now and said they'd like to buy your house for $100,000, legitimate offer. They might have had cash in hand. That doesn't make it a good offer. It doesn't mean that we should sell it. And we certainly don't need to mark down our financial statements because of some silly offer that somebody made. Uh and that's the nature of the financial markets is the behavior. And the behavior of the markets is what caused the behavior of investors to often suffer. Yeah. And Paul, I, 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 I do think that uh, this fear of law, in fact, all of these things you're talking about, I see it. Not only do I see it with individuals, I see it with sexes. I mean, I see, for example, I know from studies that women make better long-term investors than men do. The, the The weakness with with women has been that they don't invest enough, but they are better at buying and holding than men are, according to the studies that have been done. And so is whether, you know, let's say they are the nesters, uh, they maybe they are the people who aren't as overconfident. Maybe men as a group are more overconfident than women. But you know these these biases can can be very different from person to person, as you indicated, based on how you were raised. Your dad uh, yelling at you or talking sternly at you about turning off the light, and uh, and and my dad uh, maybe giving me a little more than a light tap on my back backside to to encourage me not to do what I just did again. You know, all of those things have have an impact on us, 
And a lot of people are truly, you said it, are afraid of losing money. They will never go on the stock market because they believe that money is going to be taken away from them. How do you how do you help somebody in your book? How do you help somebody get over that terrific, difficult bias? Well, two ways. One, you show them the advantage of not having the bias that they have. Uh, and you show them the cost associated or the loss that's potentially derived from that bias. You can also recognize that, you know, we're all biased. Men are biased differently than women. Society biases us to, to act a certain way or expects us to act a certain way. The man is perceived to be macho. He's perceived to be a higher risk taker. So they tend to kind of position themselves that way. The, the woman is probably a uh, uh, th two or three generations removed from where they were the housewife and they, uh, you know, worked on the farm maybe and they didn't make the same kind of decisions. Uh, so I think society imposes a perceived bias on people. Uh, and if we perceive that that's a bias that we have, the only way to correct it is to just take it away. You know, why do we think a loss is loss? You know, a football coach that tells his team to go in and win the game doesn't tell them to go in and never lose a yard. He says, go in and win the game, knowing the only way to win the game is to risk losing the yards. And so if you can get rid of the connection between loss and winning or between loss, money and losing value, we have to retrain ourselves. And retraining ourselves isn't easy. We are pretty rigid people. We tend to stick to our notion. When we look at biases, one of the biases that we have is confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. We look for people and we look for things that will confirm what we already believe. And we'll go out of our way to avoid listening to somebody talk about something that is contrary to our belief. We'll, we'll pick up a newspaper and read a contrary opinion often because, we, you know, we just don't want to. We don't like it. We've got to learn to do that. Scientists, when they have a hypothesis, they will formulate the hypothesis and then they will go out to try to prove the hypothesis. They do that by finding evidence to support the hypothesis. And they find people that oppose the hypothesis and find out why they oppose it. And if you can dispense with the opposition by showing that the opposition was wrong and you can find enough evidence to support your hypothesis, you've got facts. And that's what people need to do. They need to become uh, psychologists in a sense. Uh, they, I say that literally. I mean, we need to take time to think. So rarely. Uh... <laughs> so yeah. so let, let me ask then, I, I think one of the toughest uh, jobs we have as an investor is deciding the source or the person or a group that we can trust to give us the right information that's that's in our best interest. How do we deal with that? That must be a bias we have that we that we don't trust people or 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 that sometimes we trust too easily. But what guidance would you give us in the world of trust? Well, I don't like to use the word skeptic because it has negative connotations, but we need to be skeptical at times. We need to be not untrust. We, we, we just need to take the time to ask ourselves, is this really an expert I'm listening to? Why do I think he's an expert? Is it because he's standing in front of a microphone or in front of a camera? Or is it because it has some kind of real claim on wisdom and the knowledge that is the basis for wisdom? Uh, that tendency to challenge our thinking is a basic belief that Kahneman had. And that is when you hear something that's intuitive, we know that uh, two and two is four. But if we stop long enough, uh, we might want to shift it over. Why is it four? You know, is, you know, first thing comes to mind when you hear the word up is down. Well, why is that? Well, we're biased to thinking in opposing terms. Mm. Up, down, win, lose, good, mm -hmm. bad. You know, if, if, uh, buy, worst thing that comes to mind when people hear the word buy is sell. It's yeah. not a good linkage at all. It might be the worst possible thing to think about if you're investing. If you buy something as an investment and the next thing you're thinking about is the word sell and that that thinking process drives a behavior and you then turn around and sell, you've yeah. allowed that uh, uh, you need to be skeptical and just challenge as it is you believe. Well, I think those are all all great thoughts. Now, I I want to make sure that we've 
hit the most important highlights of the book. Uh, we haven't told people that the book is free. I mean, uh, I think that's important. So there's absolutely nothing that could stop you from ordering this book if you thought it would be helpful to your financial future. But what are the things in that book? You've got that list of approximately 48 biases from Kahneman. You've got things in there to help people overcome those biases. Any tools, anything that the book teaches you that can help you make decisions? Yeah, be a little inventive, a little creative. Come up with some words that maybe you haven't heard before that you can use to influence your thinking going forward. In the book, I use the term spill. You know, you've never heard anybody talk about spilling money before, probably. Well, if we thought about it in those light, we'd probably try to avoid spilling money because spilling is messy. It's expensive to clean up, time consuming to clean up. And yet we spill money every day. Every time we spend, part of that expenditure goes towards spillage. So if we can just recognize that fact and say, okay, going forward, I am going to make a conscious effort to not spill money. Spilling is money that's spent that's not needed to be spent. You know, if yeah. you go to the convenience store to buy all your groceries, you probably pay more for the groceries there than if you go to the grocery store. That's convenience. We like convenience, but we also like not to spend more than we need to. So if going to the convenience store to buy all your groceries uh, is a source of spilling money, then reallocate that money rather than spill it, reallocate it over into things that will have future value, future financial value, or maybe just financial, non-financial value. We spend time with our family on vacations. You know, we're allocating our time. And the memories we have from spending time with a family are precious. You know, it's not as though we can't have rewards other than financial. We need those rewards. We need to feel satisfied with what we're doing. We need to feel good about ourselves. Uh, but take the time to explore the meaning of words. Uh, you probably, or most people, have never seen the word wealth written out, like in the title of the book. Why is that? Well, most people, when you ask them what the plural of wealth is, they say, well, I think it is already plural. I don't think there is a plural. Well, sure there is. Because you could have a wealth of integrity, you could have a wealth of knowledge, you could have a wealth of joy, you could have a wealth of decency, you could have a wealth of great memories. Those are all wealths. So wealth is an abundance of something of value. Wealth is an abundance of things of value. So if there are things of value, we should strive to achieve them. So the striving for wealths, plural, take away the financial aspect of it. If you don't like to be thought of in terms of just trying to obtain money, just go for the wealths that are important. Go for a greater wealth of knowledge. Take the time to learn something new. A, a greater wealth of friendships. Get to know some new people. Uh, take the time to know yourself better. Uh, have a wealth of knowledge about yourself. Uh, so finding ways to kind of keep yourself on the path uh, and find out where you are today. You know, where are you financially today? If you're looking at your future, and your future of retirement is, say, 20, 30, 40 years from now, things are going to be very different then. Just go back and look 25 years ago. What was a house worth, the average house? What's it worth today? Well, if an increment in 25 years was such and such, what would it be if it was that same increment in the next 25 years? That house would be $6 million, maybe. It's yeah. hard to believe. Uh, our, our, right. minds, our minds are very limited in terms of what they can kind of comprehend and even consider. Uh, calculators I, help, don't they? Calculators? Oh, I yeah. think you have yeah, a calculator or two in the book. Well, yeah. Having the ability to look at what a cost of a latte, $5 for a latte, uh, you know, that's only $5. I've got $6 in my pocket, so I'll still have a dollar left over when I when I spill that latte. Well, don't spill it all. Buy a coffee with cream in it and something you enjoy. You need time out. You need to relax, re-energize yourself. Take some of that money that might have been spilled otherwise and allocate it into that investment account that's going to be worth more in the future. You're going to need a lot more in the future than you probably stop to realize. Uh, I bought a car in 1978 because I I literally needed a new car. And uh, so I went down to, and I'm pretty thrifty. So and I've been around engines a lot and I like diesel engines because they're cheaper to operate. The fuel is less expensive. They last longer. So I went down and I went to the dealer and I asked him if he used diesel cars. And he said, yeah, we took one in yesterday. And he took me out back. He showed me this 
really good looking car. It's only three years old, not a scratch on it, and uh, had a diesel engine in it, and uh, uh, it had been owned by a, a minister who drove it around his local community uh, uh, every day, and that was the extent of the use, and he took it to the dealer every year to have it serviced. Uh, and I got home, and I had this nice three-year-old car, and I looked at it, and I climbed in the back seat because I'd never been in the back seat of it before. And in the back in the back pocket of the driver's seat was a brochure for a brand new one. This dealer was smart. He figured eventually I'd get around to seeing this thing. So I pulled it out, and I looked at it, and I thought, hmm, I didn't realize they changed the body style. This new body style is really much nicer than the car I'm sitting in. And I thumbed through the brochure, and I said, oh, man, you can get this car with leather. I love leather. So I took the car back the next day to the dealer. And I said, hey, if we can just reverse that transaction yesterday, how much more would it cost me to buy a new one? He said, 10000 about. And I was in a position to be able to say, OK. So I gave him $10,000. And I drove away in a brand new car. You know, oh, man, did I ever feel good? You know, this was prestige at its, at its finest. You know, my ego, my self-esteem was enhanced. Uh, I just wanted people to see me in that. Well, that was 40 years ago, 45 years ago, actually. If instead of giving that $10,000 to the dealer, put it in his pocket, or maybe in his investment account, mm -hmm. I had put it into my investment account, an S&P index fund, that $10,000 today would be worth $748,000. You know, that's the loss that I incurred as a result of allowing my emotion to carry the day. And, you know, fortunately, I learned from it. I haven't gone out and bought any new cars since. You know, I'll buy something three or four years old because I don't want to spill the money that would be depreciated away. So start thinking differently. Start challenging. Look back at what you've done in the past. And don't look back with regret if you would have done things differently. Look back and learn. Look yeah. back and say, oh, man, if I'd have just taken advantage of some of those things that I thought were just, you know, going to be the, the, the doom and gloom of the world. You know, the market crashed. Oh, my gosh, it's 1984. Market just went to 40% lower than it had been. Oh, why would I ever think of buying then? Well, now look back at it. How many times has the market crashed between then and now? How many opportunities have you had to step in at a time when it seems unpopular to do what tends to be very, very popular over extended times? So be different. That's what this book is about. If you could read one book, somebody said, this would be the book they would read twice, first and last because it's very different. It's about who you are. And the chapters that precede that uh, summary of thinking fast and slow, those are just nothing more than applications of those principles that Kahneman talked about. They're tools. They'll help you get over being yourself and go on to being somebody that you can be and you can be and just puts a little bit of effort. So, so Paul, let's make sure that our viewers and listeners uh, we'll know where to get this book. One place they'll be able to get it is in the notes in this in this conversation. There'll be a link to that. Um, it also, if people want to pay for it, is it available at uh, uh, at Amazon or did you take it down from Amazon? Well, I wanted the information out in the public domain. I would like to have some of the comments that people have made that every Every person in high school should be required to read this book. And so trying to sell a book, it makes it sound like the author's trying to make money. And I'm not trying to make money on this. I don't need it. I live very comfortably. But yeah. I would love to see the concepts of spending your way to wealth broadened to where more people benefit from it. So I'm giving the book away, giving it away. Anybody that wants it, I consider anybody is capable of being an educator a parent, a grandparent, a teacher, an administrator in a school, a state official, you know, we're all educators. I would like to see this book in the hands of a lot of people who might not read much of it. They don't need to read much of it. They just need to read a little bit of it at a time to gain mm -hmm. some new insights and think, wow, that's really, that's pretty remarkable. I need to be more like that. Not big changes, just not a change in uh, mind just change in direction. I'm going to allocate more money into things that are going to be worth more in the future. Because I've taken the time to know how much I'm going to need. Uh, I'm not just going to let a wag or a, a guess tell me what I'm going to need. I'm going to sit down and really give it some serious thought. And you can do that in less than 15, 20 minutes if you just try. 
just do the yeah. multiplication. You know, a hamburger that costs five dollars a pound today in uh, fifty years is going to cost well, it's going to cost four times that. Yeah, sixteen dollars a pound. But if that money that went into the hamburger, uh, if half of it went into the S and P index fund, you'd have you'd have well over a million dollars. Yeah. So uh, it is it it's it is hard for people to believe the impact of compounding over time. A hundred dollars in the S and P five hundred ninety six years ago is worth just a little under. A million dollars in small cap value, it's it's just uh, a little under I think fifteen million dollars, and so the the problem is finding people who have ninety six years to live, but you know something many of us have those people in our lives, and so here's the challenge: I know how to show people how to put money away for their children and their grandchildren for a newborn child and how to do that for the next hundred years. The problem is having the child or the grandchild have their head on straight about this process. And unfortunately, so many of these young people are tapped out by the, the emotions of fear of missing out or you only live once FOMO and YOLO. Um, do you think do you think this book in any way addresses the FOMO and YOLO that that we're trying to figure out how to you know impress on our kids to overcome those short term emotions? You think it's there in the book? Well, it's the main thrust of the book is to get there people to think okay. in those terms. Uh, you go to www.investorship.com. That's a word that people haven't heard before, but it's a word that describes the the mental faculties of people who are really good financial decision makers. Warren Buffett has investorship qualities. He thinks differently. He does things differently and he does things better from a financial point of view. And he lives a much fuller life because of what he does. Uh, our minds are wonderful things if we'll use them, but we tend to not use them as much as we should. If I asked somebody, if you took a penny and doubled it every day for 31 days, what would you have? You know, and they'd be penny, two pennies, four pennies, you know, so on. Uh, and I ask people in a large crowd to shout out a number. And, you know, the numbers that come out anywhere from, you know, $90,000 to maybe six, seven hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's about the range. And most people are around under a hundred, uh, under a hundred thousand. The answer to that question, doubling a penny every day for, 31 days, you'd have $21 million. People can't comprehend that. In fact, if I tell somebody that, the tendency is to not believe it. Right. If I'm a financial advisor and I told somebody that, they think this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And they go find somebody that said something that sounded more reasonable. Just take that ledger page, one through 31, and take one, two, four. We've anchored ourselves. This is another bias we have. We anchored ourselves to that one cent, two cent, four cent. We anchored ourselves to a low thinking number. We didn't allow ourselves to think, oh man, that could be an awful lot. Uh, so again, just uh, thinking differently, uh, getting the book. Uh, if all you did was buy the book and put it under your pillow, and all you did was look at the cover every day and you saw that uh, spilling, uh, and uh, the cover has got four cartoon, six characters on it, uh, yeah. two grandparents, two parents, and two kids. And all of them have money flowing out of their purse and out of their wallet and out of their, uh, you know, they're spilling money. They're spilling, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and the, grand, the grandfather's looking back rather chagrined and wishing, I wish those kids didn't do all that uh, because I know what's going to be the consequence. But just get the book and open it up and read one page. Read something that's so different that you start thinking, I better read some more. And Paul, I want to make it clear because a minute ago you said, and you go buy the book. I know it's available free on our website, on your website. Uh, is it, but is it for people who'd like to hold the book, is it available at Amazon at this point? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So Amazon, any bookstore can order it for you, but okay. I, I would suggest you do two things. One, you download the book. So you've got it on your iPad or your iPhone uh, that you can look at when you're traveling or when you just get the time to spend a few minutes 
but then have the book at home on your bookshelf and have it around where the kids can pick it up and look at it. Buy a couple of copies and give it to a friend. Uh, some people I know have bought multiple copies of hundreds. Uh, the first batch of books I sold went to a financial advisor who wanted to give it to their clients uh, and bought uh, large quantities of it to give away. So, you know, my interest is having people read it, whether they buy it or whether they get the electronic version of it. I think the electronic version is wonderful. All you have to do is click on a QR code and it'll download automatically or take a picture of the QR code. And mm -hmm. uh, it's so easy to get for nothing. You can do it before you leave the room you're sitting in right now. Right. <laughs> Well, Paul, you, you are magnificent. I have appreciated your energy, your commitment to helping others for as long as I've known you. And uh, uh, people don't know that you actually had uh, an investor ship. You had a boat, beautiful boat that you taught classes in called investor ship. I loved it. And uh, I, I think the work you do is, is great. And this is a great way I think for people to be spending their their retirement. I don't know that our wives would necessarily agree with that comment, but I know that you and I are having a good time helping others. Thank you very much. Any parting words, anything, a famous saying that you hope people will never forget? I would hope everybody avails themselves of a diversified portfolio of wealth. Okay, that's great. I'll be working on that. Thank you, Paul. Good to talk to you, Paul. All Thanks right. You, you Bye -bye. bet.